Amen. My study this morning is uh, a study Elder Tess gave in October 2020, and it's it's really a combination of two studies. It's the Apis Bull, a warning, and the form and the spirit. Um, one of the first points Elder Tess gave in this presentation was that it was imperative that we um, follow the development of the message. Because if we don't, and we kind of feeling secure, it was because one day we were going to hear the message say something that we weren't prepared for. Because many people uh, think their faith is strong enough and have instead found themselves shaken out of this movement. And I can honestly say from my experience is when you receive light, it prepares you for what comes next. And it was especially at that time when a lot of change was being made in the way we thought. Uh, there was time setting, Sunday law not being Sabbath, Sunday test, the nature of Christ, the LGBT community and literal to spiritual were just some of the things that we had to change our thinking on. We must remember this was the time of trouble for the priests. And many people were in danger of being distracted as concerns heaped around them and they were failing to keep up with the advancing steps of the movement. The study we are reviewing was from October 2020, which was past the increase of knowledge way mark. God was shining knowledge upon this movement and it is advancing rapidly. If we were not following that increase of knowledge, its formalization would have come as a surprise and we would not have been ready for the testing message. My point is that in every dispensation has people who fail that test this dispensation will be no different. The APIS Bull study was presented in May 2020, beginning a series in Australia. The intention was to bring us to a study of Millerite history, which in some ways it did, but we want to begin with the APIS Bull. This is a drawing of an Omega history and Alpha history. I haven't been specific about the Alpha and that we know there is also a history in the middle. So there was a history of failure, failure, then success. One thing she did recommend, we draw these lines out and label the way marks. Uh, we're not going to do that this morning, but she did recommend, recommend it. Um, you can reply this structure um, either to ancient or modern Israel. And it's not until you start labeling the way marks. And for instance, I've got an example there. This could be 34 AD or the Sunday law. Um, and we know the beginning and the end of Israel, whichever Israel that is, in the Omega history, there are two calls to the church and one call to the world. Um, the next line is the Eden to Eden line. And we know at the end, Eden comes after the 1,000 years. But we wanted just to speak about the time on earth. I want you to keep in mind, though, the study of Eden to Eden as we work through this. Because we are going to discuss ancient Israel 
and I want to put it in context. So you have Eden, sin, a curse because of the fall. From Eden to the flood is about 1,500 years. And then about 2,500 years after the fall, you come to the beginning of ancient Israel. The point I want to make is the following. You have the flood 1,500 years after the fall. And how much do they have written about God? And we know there was nothing. Why is there no Old Testament scripture written in the first 1,500 years? Now, for much of the time, Adam is still alive. There is word of mouth. People had good memories. Some would say they were very intelligent back then. And yet at the flood, only eight people are saved. So they are intelligent in some respects. But their memories, their mind is much more exact than ours. So there was no need for writing. But they also simply didn't have it. People didn't write. The invention of letters had not yet begun. It wasn't necessary. Then you come to the time period after the flood. What starts to hap what starts happening to our lifespan? It rapidly shrinks by hundreds of years. So we know there's a deterioration. Written language is beginning to be introduced because quite frankly, it begins, begins to be needed. It is now necessary to keep records. And so the knowledge of God starts getting transmitted into written form. But still 2,500 years after the fall, that has not been formalised. It becomes the work of Moses. By this stage, God's people have been in Egypt about 400 years and they have lost the knowledge of God. Humanity is forgetting his character and this is a crisis. So at the time of the end, there is a raising up of Moses, the beginning of ancient Israel. He leads out the people, but he will do something else for the people, and we'll mention that later on. Um, can I have someone to read this first quote, please? It's from Review and Herald, January 9, 1894, paragraph 6. I can read that for you if you like, John. Thanks, Lynn. Um, the Lord commanded Moses to go and speak unto Pharaoh, bidding him to allow Israel to leave Egypt. For 400 years, they had been in Egypt and had been in slavery to the Egyptians. They had been corrupted by idolatry and the time came when God called them forth from Egypt in order that they might obey his laws and keep his Sabbath, which he had instituted in Eden. He spoke the Ten Commandments to them in awful grandeur from Mount Sinai that they might understand the sacred and enduring character of the law and build up the foundation of many generations by teaching their children the binding claims of God's holy precepts. Thanks, Lynn. Try and imagine the big picture of what has happened. Personal contact between God, Adam and Eve comes to an end. 1,500 years of word of mouth the flood, then a thousand years of deterioration. The people do not have anything in writing to hang on to. 
Word of mouth is failing them. They are surrounded by Egyptians and idolatry. Moses is a part of that. For all his good qualities, he is a part of the same system, damaged by the same system. If I was to ask this question, who understands God's character better, you or Miller? I would hope you would say you do. That should be simple. So who understands God's character, you or Martin Luther? I think you would say you. Who understood better, you or Peter, you or John the Baptist, you or Moses? I hope the answer would be you. Because we are a thousand, thousands of years in. Abraham did not know slavery was a sin. Not all of them understood polygamy. There was a lot that was, is lacking. That's what the study of Eden to Eden teaches us. It is clear in that study that God is restoring his image. If he is restoring it, it is a process. Not just over your lifetime, but a 6,000 year process. And it is still going to need a thousand years in heaven. So Moses is a part of the same damaged system. He is trying to lead a people damaged by that system. They are corrupted by idolatry. They have no written word to turn to. So God leads them into the wilderness. We're not going to go through the whole Apis full study. We know what happened in the wilderness. They reach a point in this time period where they make themselves the golden calf. That golden calf was the Apis bull. So in this time period, they have been damaged by idolatry and idolatry says that if you want to be safe, what do you need? You need this strong warlike God King who is going to kill all your enemies. Remember, they cannot see God. Moses has disappeared and they are going to re -re recreate the Apis bull of the Egyptians. This is a quote and it's found in the Bible commentary, volume one, page 665. And it's a comment on Exodus 32, verse four. The calf would naturally suggest itself to the Israelites because they had witnessed in Egypt the worship of the Apis bull. But the golden calf was presumably a material representation of the true God, not of some high heathen deity. Now, I think Exodus 32 verse 5 backs that up. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So when they built the calf, it was really a representation of the true God, not of some heathen deity. So they are going to say, this is God, not the apis bull. They are just going to say, this is what he looks like. This is a representation of him. So they are not saying they are worshipping an entire different God. Instead, they are taking the character of the apis bull and subscribing it to God because they want a strong warlike God king who is going to destroy their enemies. In the study of the apis bull, we worked through its characteristics and 
We know it had to be born by miraculous conception. It was seen to have a fighting spirit. It had to be a manifestation of the king. And it was pictured as tearing down the walls of a city. And it was the symbol of strength and fertility. And we know Egyptian uh, male kings were sometimes referred to as a strong bull. So courage, strength, fighting spirit, conquering of enemies, kingship, all the things they were taking from the apis bull and subscribing to God. Then we look at the issues when they entered Canaan. They are in Ramah. And we know Ramah means the seat of idolatry. What do they ask Samuel for here? <laughs> this is where they ask for a strong king. Why? Because they have transcribed to God all the characteristics of this idol. They have been wishing to see them in Moses, and now they still want this. So in Ramah, they are going to ask for the apis bull. And God says, if that is what you want, that is what you will have. Travel forward, and they're coming out of Babylon, cured of building any more images. But what was the problem? The problem was that it was never just the image. It's the image and the character associated with that image. Two things, the form and the character. They come out of Babylon, cured of the form. They are not going to build any more statues. But the greatest danger they held onto from the apis bull was that they subscribed the character of this idol to God. Because after all this time, they no longer knew what God's character looked like. And if you don't know what God's character looks like, you are going to mold something with your own hands. So they come into Christ history where they're looking for the Messiah. John is teaching and John is steeped in idolatry. John is saying that there is this great warrior king rising up. He's going to clean out the house of God and destroy the Romans. Because John is steeped in idolatry, as are all the people around him, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But when Christ comes, he comes in his humiliation. No conquering armies were visible to mortal eyes. And the unbelieving Jews decided that he could not be the illustrious king for whom they were looking. So they rejected the son of God when he was in front of them. They could not recognize him. But while they might have destroyed the form of their idol, they never destroyed the character of their idol. All through their history, they were subscribing to God the same character as the idol they see in paganism. However moral they are down in this history, I'm talking about Christ's history, however stringently they kept the Sabbath, However stringently they kept all the laws, they completely misunderstood the character of God. Um, we'll go back to Exodus 20 and read verses 18 to 21. And could someone read those voices, uh, those verses, please? I can do that, John. Thank you. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, 
speak thou with us and we will hear but let not god speak with us lest we die and moses said unto the people fear not for god is come to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not and the people stood afar off and moses drew near unto the thick darkness where god was thank you the ten commandments we know have just been pronounced and the people are terrified they don't they don't let god they say don't let god speak to us again he can speak to moses moses can tell us but don't let god speak to us i just want to paraphrase a few parts of patriarchs and prophets and this is from chapter 27 uh, page 303 she begins by speaking about moses climbing up the mountain to meet with god god was wishing to bring israel into a close and peculiar relationship with himself to be incorporated as a church and a nation under the government of god which is the true church state union jehovah revealed himself not alone in the all, awful majesty of judge and lawgiver but as the compassionate guardian of his people all of this was based upon the great fundamental principle of love then she quotes from luke 10 27 thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself but the people of israel were overwhelmed with terror they cried to moses you speak with us and we will hear but let not god speak with us or we will die moses said don't be afraid the people however remained at a distance gazing in terror <clears throat> upon the scene while moses drew near unto the thick darkness where god was the minds of the people blinded and debased by slavery and heathenism were not prepared to fully appreciate the far-reaching principles of god's 10 precepts at the oceana camp meeting in september 2020 um, elder tess spoke about the constitution and how obama called it the north star the problem though is with humanity thomas jefferson could not see the far-reaching principles of the constitution but they were supposed to see how far reaching those principles were. You find ancient Israel in the same position. So God is going to break it down into simple instructions that they can implement and understand. But he is going to do that privately to Moses. He won't speak to them again because they pleaded for him not to. So can you see the difficulty God is in after 2,500 years? People do not understand the character of God anymore. Not only do they hope he is that fearful God King, but they are terrified of it. Seems ironic, doesn't it? <laughs> But even through that fear, that is what they want all the way through this history. And some ways that is what he actually gives to them. He was trying to show them his love and they asked him to remove himself and be distant from them. Just as when they asked for a king, he honours their request. The first thing after the Ten Commandments 
is going to tell them to be nice to their slaves, and that's Exodus 21. Is he telling them not to have slaves? No. He is restrained by their own conditions. So he withdraws himself. He gives instructions suited for their condition. He only speaks through Moses from now on all the way up to when they ask for a king and he gives one to them. He is restrained by the damaged condition of his own people and he starts having Moses make records. So Moses is now going to start putting together Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the first five books. The point of this Apis Bull study wasn't just his, how do you pronounce it? historical. It is our own condition. In the Alpha history, the people do not understand the character of God. Now in our history, Elder Jeff may understand a whole lot better than Moses did but that standard is that much higher. Back in Millerite history, Ellen White is not telling people how to be nice to their slaves. The issue in America wasn't that they were nice to their slaves. It was that they had slavery at all. There was a higher standard than at the beginning of ancient Israel. So when we come to modern Israel, God's people are meant to come out of idolatry. What idolatry? We know it's not pagan nation. It is apostate Protestantism. All through this history, you have apostate Protestantism. And as they're coming out of apostate Protestantism, Somewhere in the Alpha history, it failed, and they go into the Laodicean condition. In 1888, they are meant to come out of that Laodicean condition, but that coming out also failed. And, and we come down to our history, and Elder Jeff is neck deep in apostate Protestantism, idolatry, he does not understand the character of God. This study was to help us consider idolatry in a different light. It's not about the form of the idol. It's about the character associated with the idol. In their history, it was the apis bull. In our history, what does it look like? Right in the dispensation of 2014 to 19, you would expect we are starting to dismantle that idol. There is no issue with the Sabbath here. Everyone is keeping Sabbath. There is no graven image here. What does Adventism not understand? And we know that is the character of God. So we need an understanding of parable teaching to show us the character of God. And that takes people by surprise because it looks nothing like the idol they have built up in their mind. In 2014, they are worshipping God. And what does that God look like to them? We know he looks like a white male Republican. <clears throat> and what the Midnight Cry message began to do in 2018 is start to take apart that idol. For the priests, what were we saying? Come out of Babylon, my people. Come out of the idolatry of apostate Protestantism. Destroy your idols. 
And from September 2018 to September 2019, the message increasingly, increasingly made an attack on our idol worship. But many people were not prepared to let go. Have you ever heard somebody say at that time, the lines are good, I have no major problem with the message. But where is the love? We need to spend more time just dwelling on God, thinking about how nice Jesus was and how he died for us, just thinking about his love. And we know how in George's presentation this morning, how he explained just what that love is, and that is the message of equality. And people feel love is lacking as we focus on these lines. But think of it this way. If I came to you one day and say, I really love you, I think about you all the time. I just want to spend every moment of every day dwelling on you, contemplating how wonderful you are. And you say, what do you think when you do that? What is going through your mind? And I say, I think you are really nice. But then I start telling you all about myself. You wouldn't feel particularly loved. If really I was spending all day just thinking about myself. This is what we do to God. We think we spend all day dwelling on him. This fictional model in our mind, this idol. Because when you think I'm loving you, who am I actually in love with? I'm in love with myself. What we are doing is worshipping a God made in our image after our likeness. That is the definition of idolatry. And you do not need the form of that to be idolatry. In 2019, this point was brought to a head because so many people in the movement were worshipping a white conservative Republican male God. <laughs> that is what they were taught was their hero, a type of apis bull. They were presented with the true character of God and like the Jews of old, they could not recognize him. As we know, when it comes to idolatry, there is the form and there is the mind. They, ancient Israel, lost the form and held on to the mind. Now, when we get into our own history, when it comes to equality, you have the same thing. The form of equality and the mind of equality, the character, the heart of equality. The danger is that in the thought of accepting or rejecting the form, we have stated our position. In 2019, the form was announced, and that was women elders, trousers, Rejection of nationality or nationalism. Women in leadership across the world. Women were rising, rising up and teaching across the world. So this movement instituted the form. And we know for many people that was too much and they left. That was the division of 2019. The issue we faced in 2020 was not the form of equality, but the mind. The compare and contrast is a chiasm. Idolatry and equality, the form and the mind. With idolatry, they lost the form and held on to the mind. With the true, we can take the form yet not the mind. 
The movement has the form of equality, while many in it have the mind of inequality. Many who have rejected have already rejected that message have already left. But what the people didn't realize in that this was a test of the mind. This is not a peace and safety message. And all you have to do is say women are equal. Because some never expected that the form would have implications for how they thought and how they lived. It is one thing to say women are equal. It is one thing to put a woman on a board, make her a leader, have her teach, have her run your school. It is another thing to empower her and treat her with respect when she does. And people who like the idea of the form are finding it excruciatingly painful to change the mind. Men like the idea of equality, but are rebelling against the change of character that it has to bring with it to be successful. <clears throat> if there are two issues with idolatry, then we face the two issues with true worship. Ancient Israel had the mind of paganism. We have the mind of evangelical Protestantism, whether it is sexism, racism, homophobia, conspiracy theories, vaccinations, or libertarianism. I've noticed, especially through the pandemic, there were a lot of Adventists who wouldn't get vaccinated, who believe in conspiracy theories and are crying out against government restrictions, are crying out against socialism. Where did Adventism get that from? Because you don't get much more socialist than redistributing wealth every 50 years. And you can find that in a Le Leviticus 25. When they say socialism is the danger, they did not get that from the Bible. They got it from evangelical, evangelical America. Paganism forms a God in their own image and we know Catholicism is a good example of this. Is it um, conservative Catholics or is it liberal Catholics that revere Mary the most? And we could uh, say, is it John Paul II or Francis? And we know that that was John Paul II. So why are the sexist conservatives revering Mary. What they have done, they have taken this woman, an ordinary flesh and blood woman, and they have lifted her up to this holy standard. They create a hot halo around her head and make her holy. But why is Mary holy to them? Because she is two things, that you have to be in order to be a female and worth anything in conservative Catholicism. One, you have to be a virgin. The minute your virginity is gone, you are not worth anything. They have this Catholic saint. <clears throat> and the story goes like this. She was attacked one day by a man who was going to rape her. She caused him to kill her rather than rape her because she would rather die than, she lo than lose her virginity. And they supposedly made her a saint for that act. They think she was so holy because she recognised it would be better for her to lose her life than her virginity because a woman who has lost her virginity from an ultra-conservative Catholic point of view, 
become something, something disgusting. But then they have another problem. You have to bear children. If you're a woman, unless you were bearing children, you were worthless. So to be a holy Catholic woman with nothing to be ashamed of, you have to be two things. You have to be a virgin and you have to bear children because that is your job, job function in life. That is why you exist. Can you see the problem they have put women in? Mary is a demonstration of absolute sexism because that is what a woman has to be to be worth anything. And a flesh and blood woman can never reach that standard. But the, we know the real Mary was nothing like that. She did not die a virgin and she was flesh and blood. So they have taken her and constructed a God in their own image, something that fits their worldview, an entirely sexist fictional construct. We do the same thing, and that is what caused the shaking in 2019. Could someone please read quote three there? And it's from early writings, 14 paragraph one. I read, John. Thanks, Molly. Soon we had the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and hour of Jesus' coming. The living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. When God spoke the time, he bore upon us the Holy Ghost, and our faces began to light up and shine with the glory of God as Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai. Thank you, Molly. So in the history of the time of trouble of the 144,000, God gives them the time of his second advent. The question I am asking, what way mark is that? And we know it's the formalization. When God spoke the time, he poured upon us the Holy Ghost and our faces began to light up and shine with the glory of God. When Moses' face lit up and shone with the glory of God, what had he just seen? What does Ellen White say he had just seen? We know the glory was his character. So this formalization, when the time is given, we are given the glory of God, which is his character. Uh, this quote is just uh, from Review and Herald, May 10, 1887, paragraph, paragraph 20. We must get ready for the latter rain. The earth is to be lighted with the glory of the third angel. Not a little corner only, but the whole earth. The earth is to be lighted with the glory of the third angel. When the message shall go forth with a loud cry. So when the earth is lighted with the glory of the third angel's message, you would expect to see the earth lighted with the glory of God. That is the formalization of the message, the tongues of fire in the upper room. The disciples were lighted up with the glory of God. It is at the formalization of the message that you see the lighting up of the glory of God. It is a revelation of his character. Remember when the disciples were called before the council, what did they say about the disciples? And we know that can be found in Acts 4.13. They took 
uh, note that they had been with Jesus. They not only saw Peter and John, they saw Jesus because they were manifesting his glory. The only reason people cannot see the love of God in this message, in every parabolic component of it, is connected to whatever degree they are still worshipping a God of their own construction, a God made in their own image. Right back here in Egypt's time, they lost sight of him. We're in a 6,000 year process of understanding him. It's slow and laborious because God is patient. And yet for many, the test is still too hard. If I'm holding something in my hand and you try to pull it from me, that can be easy or that can be hard. It depends on how hard I grip. The tests are not hard unless we have a strong grip on our idols. People may say we have changed our view of God so far. Don't say anything radical in the future. An elder Tessa's response to that saying was this, what hope is left? Because we're only in the, we were only in the early rain, and that was 2020 I'm talking about. We had a lat latter rain, the harvest to go yet. When you see the loud cry light up the earth with the glory of God's character, the problem is you already think you know what that character looks like. If you thought it was racist and sexist, you would already be out of this movement. And we all understand it's not homophobic as well now, which was a further understanding of the character of God. So that required a further cleansing from our idolatry. To those who say, I don't see any love in this message and we need more love, who is it? that they think they love. Because if you love me, I would want you to love who I am, what I believe, what I stand for. This movement, this message, this methodology is the only way God has to tell us what he is like. Every other broad way or broad door is easy. Because it is easy to build a God in your own image. You know you're going to like what you see because people do love themselves. But when you start having to construct a God you are not comfortable with, that becomes a different story. Why can't God show us his glory, his character? We are told that if, we, if he should show us his glory, it would destroy us. That just sounds spiritualistic like tongues of fire. I would suggest it would destroy people if they saw the glory, character of God, just like the last dispensation, when people saw his glory, they didn't want it. They saw the glory and it destroyed them. God can't show us his glory because we wouldn't want him. Because in the last dispensation, we were racist and sexist. And it's hard to accept a God that wasn't. And as we have gone through another dispensation and learned more about his character, that God is not homophobic, etc. The question that each one of us must ask ourselves is, do we love the God we have been shown? That we may be formed in his image, not the other way around, where we are trying to form a God in our image. And could someone read this last quote, please?
It's from 3T251 and 2. I'll read it. I have been shown that the greatest reason why the people of God are now found in this state of spiritual blindness is that they will not receive a correction. Many have despised the reproofs and warnings given them. The true witness condemns the lukewarm condition of the people of God, which gives Satan great power over them in this waiting, watching time. The selfish, the proud, and the lovers of sin are ever assailed with doubts. Satan has ability to suggest doubts and to devise objections to the pointed testimony that God sends, and many think it a virtue, a mark of intelligence in them, to be unbelieving and to question and quibble. Those who desire to doubt will have plenty of room. God does not propose to remove all occasion for unbelief. He gives evidence which must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and a teachable spirit, and all should decide from the weight of evidence. Eternal life is of infinite value and will cost us all that we have. I was shown that we do not place a proper estimate upon eternal things. Everything worth possessing, even in this world, must be secured by effort and sometimes by most painful sacrifice. And this is merely to obtain a perishable treasure. Shall we be less willing to endure conflict and toil and to make earnest efforts and great sacrifices to obtain a treasure which is of infinite value and a life which will measure with that of the infinite? Can heaven cost us too much? The reason for that quote was that why do we only desire the form but not the character? <clears throat> and the greatest reason is that we learn from that um, quote is that we will not take correction. And those who desire to doubt will have plenty of room. God does not remove all occasion for unbelief. He gives evidence which must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and a teachable spirit. Cannot we see God's love and how he has led us gently? He has not hit us with all these truths all at once. But that is why it is so important to keep up with the advancing light. Because I believe the acceptance of one truth prepares you to receive the next. God does not try to change you all at once, but he is trying to change us so that we might lighten the earth with his glory, his character. This is the whole point of the message. It is showing us God's glory and it is beholding his glory that we are changed. It is the glad reception of these messages and then living them, not just the form, not just the words, but the character, the mind. But the most important thing to remember, the way that God is showing us his glory, his character, is through these messages. He is pouring out his spirit upon us through these messages. And to finish off, remember what Deuteronomy 32, verse 2 says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herd and as the showers upon the grass. Anyway, <clears throat> that's my presentation. Thanks for listening this morning. Can we close in prayer? Our loving God in heaven, 
we thank you again for the times in which we are living and you are revealing your character to each one of us through these messages. We thank you for your love and mercy. And may we see your love in these messages. And we pray that we would not just give lip service to them, but that we would live these truths, that we would show that equality to all. We pray for your grace to do so. We pray that your spirit would dwell in each one of us, that we would reflect your character, not only to each other, but to those that we come in contact with. We thank you again for all that you have done for us. We thank you for our leaders that brought us these messages, and we especially mentioned Elder Tess and Elder Parminda and Elder Terry. We thank you. We just pray that you will be with us for the remainder of this Sabbath. We pray for your blessing upon each one of us. And we would ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.